When I was younger, I drank a lot of soft drinks. <laughs> and my beverage of choice was Dr. Pepper. Little did I know that the creator of Dr. Pepper was from Christianburg, Virginia, because I never heard of Christianburg, Virginia. I thought it was created in Texas. And so Dr. Pepper was, even though I grew up in Georgia and I was basically bottle-fed Coke from an early age, Dr. Pepper became my choice. <laughs> and nothing would frustrate me more than when we would go out to eat at a restaurant and I would ask, the server would come, and I was always getting me a soft drink. She's like, can I get you something to drink? And my wife would be good, and she'd be like, I'll take a water with lemon. And I'd be like, Dr. Pepper, please. And then they would say the dreaded words. <laughs> we don't have Dr. Pepper, but we have Mr. Pibb. Is that good enough? No. <laughs> That's not good enough. It's not the same at all. And one time, one server thought they would be clever and not tell me and just bring me the Mr. Pib. I didn't even have to drink it. By the time I got it to where I could smell it, I was like, this is not Dr. Pepper. And, I, and the person, I was like, this isn't Dr. Pepper, this is Mr. Pib. And they're like, and then they're like, we think you have a problem, sir. <laughs> hey, I aced the Pepsi taste challenge. What can I say? Tasting, though, tasting is one of those senses that is unique. We can see things, we can hear things, but tasting is something that you have to experience. I mean, coffee companies know this. I don't drink coffee either, but they, they are always trying to describe their taste. They say that, well, this blend is subtle, or this blend is rich, or this blend is bold. What does subtle taste like? I don't know. It's gibberish, it's gibberish unless you have actually tasted a subtle blend and then you know what it tastes like. Taste must be experienced. Here's another example. If I read you these ingredients, sugar enriched flour, personally hydrogenated vegetable oil, polysorbate 60, and yellow dye number five. Does that sound delicious? Of course not. But if you've seen the greatest Christmas movie ever made, you know that those are the ingredients to a Twinkie. <laughs> and if you eat a Twinkie, you know that a Twinkie tastes good. Certain things need to be tasted. They need to be personally experienced. And God is one of those things. That's the message of Psalm 34. That's where we're going to be today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them and follow along. We're going to start in verse 8. If you don't have your Bibles, that's all right. It will be on the screen behind me. This is how David, this is what David says about taste in verse 8. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. This psalm is easy to figure out the main point. Some are kind of tricky. This one is very easy because the section we're going to look at Verses 8 through 22, they begin and end with the same promise, that God is your refuge. That's called, in the theological circles, that's called an inclusio. Think of it as bookends, where, you know, you, it holds the books together. You got this and you got this so they don't move. This inclusio, this dual statement, tells you what the main point is. This psalm is also unique because it's one of the ones where we know why David is, is writing it. We know that he's writing this after a situation that happened to him in 1 Samuel 21. Now, David had already become very famous because he had killed a Philistine warrior called Goliath. And God had chosen David to be the king of Israel. So the current king, Saul, who the people chose because they ignored God's, um, God's will, Saul didn't like David, and so Saul was always trying to kill David until he didn't, and then he was trying to kill him again. It was a very weird love, hate, kill, serve relationship. And so at one point, Saul was trying to kill David, so David runs away. And in David's brilliant plan, guess where he runs? Gath. You're like, what's wrong with that? Gath is the hometown of Goliath. And everybody recognized him. They're like, hey, isn't that David? Isn't he the one that killed our champion? Isn't he the one that they sing songs about? And David's like, oops, I done messed up now. 
Oh, David, you did it again. And so he had to, he was, he certainly started being afraid for his life because he said, well, I killed Goliath, they're going to kill me. So he came up with an even more brilliant strategy. I know what I'll do. I'll act insane. And so he starts like literally like, ah, and he's like scratching the doorpost and he's like spitting on his beard and everything. And King Achish, who they had brought, they were like, King Achish, here's David, we got to do something about it. And he walks up and there's this guy, ah, and he's just acting like a conspiracy guy with on the bulletin board with all the strings. He's just like, ah. And the guy's like, that's not David. I've heard of David. I know David. And you, sir, are no David. And David's like, ha ha, it worked. But it only worked because of God's grace. And isn't that true how our plans are? We think we're so smart and we come up with all these great plans about how to solve a certain situation or how to get out of trouble. And God's just sitting back saying, like a parent looking at a kid's drawing, that's nice. Here, let me put it on the fridge because I love you, but here, let me fix it for you. That's what David had gone through. And so David proceeds to, he know he messed up. And he knows that the only reason he, he survived was because of God's grace. So he writes this psalm to praise God. And, he said, and he's inviting people. He's like, you've got to come and taste and see how awesome God is. That even when you mess up, he can still be your refuge and he will still save you. I don't know. Like I said at the beginning, I don't know what you're struggling with right now. You might not be struggling with anything, and I hope that's the case. But a lot of us are going through different things. And I want you to know that no matter what you're going through, well, I don't want you to know, David, through the Word of God, wants you to know that God can still be your refuge. And protection is not the only benefit of seeking refuge in God. Look at verse 9. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord. For those who fear God lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry. But those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. When we seek God as our refuge, we will not lack any good thing. That's the promise of Scripture. But these verses also talk about fear. And the fear of the Lord is one of those Bible phrases that can be confusing. Wait a second. This God who loves me so much that wants to be my refuge, I'm supposed to be afraid of him? Yes. God loves you, but we should still fear him, have a reverent respect for him, because not only does God love, he is also holy, and his holiness cannot compromise. Look, skip down to verse 16. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. So he's basically saying that's why we should fear God. If we are setting our face, if we're deciding to do evil, if we're deciding to continue in our sin, God has another promise. He's like, you're not going to find refuge in me. In fact, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth if you're pursuing evil and sin. God's holiness cannot tolerate evil. It just cannot. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why Jesus came, to, re, to give us a way out, to take his holiness and put it on us. The same way you change clothes. He says, take off your evil rags and put on this nice new holy shirt that says, purchased by the blood of Jesus. And when you do that, you can be saved and find refuge in Christ. The fear of the Lord is not... Be afraid, like God's a boogeyman, is basically a call. It's a challenge for those of us who want to follow Jesus to live a life that honors Jesus, to live a life that avoids evil, that does not fall into sin. It's a life of obedience based on God's commands. How do I know that? Is this just me? Spitballing, no. Verse 14 is very clear. This is what David's trying to say. So go back to verse 14. He says, point blank, turn away from evil and do what is good. Repent from your sin, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the same message in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the message I give you now. Turn away from what is evil. Repent from your sin. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek Jesus. He is the peacemaker. So what is David trying to say? I think God makes himself known 
to those of us who seek him and walk with him. There is definitely a connection between the level of someone's pursuit of God and the level of his or her experience with God. If you're not pursuing God and seeking him, then you're drinking Mr. Pibb when you should be drinking Dr. Pepper. That's what he's basically saying. Like you're choosing the inferior product. If you're seeking God, if you're pursuing Jesus, then there's going to be a stronger connection. And that makes sense, doesn't it? This is the whole garbage in, garbage out thing. You know, God's truth in, God's truth out. I'm going to be honest with you. This idea of pursuing God is the level, is kind of like connected with the level of someone's experience with God, how they can taste God. It's one of the most discouraging things to me about the American church. Here it is. It's how infrequent we attend church. And it's how, there's other things I'll talk about next week, but it's how we choose to fill our time and energy to focus on all these things that do not matter when we should be focusing on the eternal things that God has called us to do. More on that next week. (laughs) If you're sitting here today, I am not talking to you unless I am. But it is discouraging how infrequent people attend church. Now, I want to make sure you understand. Some of us, we're here every Sunday. Some of us cannot be here every Sunday because we have jobs that are over the weekend. The times have changed. 200 years ago when this church was founded, people didn't work on the weekend. But now they do. And I understand that. If your job rhythm is, I got I to gotta be here. But when I can, I will be there. Awesome. That's all God wants you to do. He wants you to provide for your family. No doubt. He's blessed you with that job and that opportunity. So embrace that job and opportunity. But when you have those moments to come, come. But there are some of us who only come when it's convenient. Or we only come when we think we're going to get something out of the message or the special We're having a lunch afterwards, or there's 200 years, or a special speaker. We only come when it's convenient, and that is a problem. Do you know, and this is one of those stats that kind of worries me, keeps me up at night as a pastor praying for people, 40 million Americans have stopped going to church in the past 20 years. It's called the great de-churching. And in some, regard, in some moments, it's the church's fault. In the late 90s, the church became one of these, like, they called them seeker-friendly, where it's kind of like, hey, come, and we'll talk directly to your felt need, and we'll do this program for you, and we'll do this for you, and we'll do that for you, and hey. And so we kind of condition people to think that way, that church is just something I add on to everything else in my life, but that is not what church is. Church is not an add-on. Jesus is not an add-on. And yes, I, you say, you're saying church is Jesus? No, no, no. I'm not saying anything is Jesus. Jesus is ultimate, but I am saying this. God has given us the church. That is his primary method for reaching this world with the gospel. And it's his primary method to encourage you and me, as we live in this broken, evil world. And when we don't do that, we're basically choosing to eat junk food all month long. And then you think, well, I've been eating all this junk food. Then, I, Well, I'm going to go to church this week because, you know, it's convenient. And that'll be healthy. It'll be like eating a Sunday salad. Do you really think that you can eat junk food 29 days out of the month and eat a salad one day and be healthy? It doesn't work that way. If it did, I would be a swimsuit model. (laughs) But there's something 
that disqualifies me from being a swimsuit model, even in the plus catalogs, and it's probably because I choose too much junk food and I drink, drink too much Dr. Pepper. I quit that, by the way. I'm five years sober, no Dr. Pepper, it's true. <laughs> and after, and after a year of not drinking Dr. Pepper, we were visiting Dana's parents. They had one in the fridge. I was like, oh, this will be fun. Pop open a cold one. Reflects, reminisce on the good old days. It was disgusting. It tasted like cough syrup. And I said, how much money and time did I waste drinking Dr. Pepper? And how the price my teeth have paid for all the soft drinks. But yet, and I'm bringing this up because I feel like that's what we do. (laughs) It's that we constantly, like, we want this junk food, flashy things that the world offers, but none of that is nutritional for us spiritually, and none of that ultimately can satisfy what we need. And so you don't get to experience God fully like David is talking about. In order to truly experience all that God has to offer and to know his goodness, you must choose to satisfy your cravings, not with junk food, but with the nutrition of God's word. And one Sunday a month is not enough. I'll go further. You could come every Sunday. But if that's the only time, the one hour you're here on Sunday morning, if that's the only time you're interacting with God's truth, that's not enough either. God created us to be in a community together. And so coming to church, you benefit from it, yes. Because that's how God designed to be. You're with brothers and sisters in Christ. You spent your whole week working at the office with a whole bunch of people that hate God. And now you can come here Sunday and be like, oh, I feel it. I can feel the joy. I can feel the truth of Jesus. But here's what we need to also understand. Church is not just for you. It's for everybody else, too. You get that? It's not just, you're not a consumer of church. You should be an active participant of church. Because when you're here, I said this to somebody in an email earlier this week. I was like, you, when I stand here and when I see you, that is an encouragement to me. It is. It's an encouragement to me. And when you're sitting there and you look side to side, when you're singing, sometimes poorly, sometimes really well, I heard you over here singing and it sounded lovely. That's not just for you. That's an encouragement to those of us singing alongside of you. And we should get that during football season. The team that executes their game plan and every person does their job, that's the team that wins. And that's, what I'm, that's my challenge is that the church, us specifically, because I can't control the American church at large, but Fort Lewis Baptist Church, that's one of the things you're going to hear about the future is us being more intentional with encouraging one another. Because what I was saying is if you only come one Sunday a month, that's not enough. It has to be, to experience God, it has to be daily. You have to take some ownership. You need to be reading the Bible. You need to be praying. It should be studying the Bible in a small group with others. Normally that's weekly. And we don't have enough Bible study groups. It's my fault. We're about to have more. And I encourage you, if you're not in a Bible study group, that you will try one of those out because there's nothing better than sitting around with a small group of people studying God's Word together. Because you will see something that I have never seen because your life experience is different than mine. And that is yet another way that we encourage one another. That's how God has designed it. David knows this. And in Psalm 34, he is challenging us to put it to the test. He's literally saying, this is the Jesus challenge. Come, taste, and see. And David is making a money-back guarantee He's like, just try it. You'll like it. I promise. 
If you don't like it, money back guarantee because I know you're going to like it. It's a guarantee but he feels confident making because of his own personal experience, but he also feels confident because he knows how consistent God is in keeping his promises. David is guaranteeing that if you taste God, you will truly discover how good he is when you experience God. Because there is nothing more satisfying than Jesus. There is nothing that this world can offer that comes close to Jesus. Look at verse 17. Here is some examples of why. These are some of the promises that God has made that we can take to the bank as a guarantee. The righteous cry out, okay? But notice the next one. The Lord hears them. You feel defeated? You feel attacked? When you cry out in your stress, in those moments of weakness, God hears you. And Jesus understands you. And God rescues them from their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Verse 19, one who is righteous has many adversaries. If you're living for Jesus, people aren't going to like you because they didn't like Jesus. That's part of following him. He told us, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it first hated me. One who is righteous has many adversaries, but the Lord rescues him from them all. Each day, each day, we fight a new battle. But it's not grief, even though your grief might be overwhelming you. The battle's not balancing your checkbook, even though that is stressing you out. The battle is not some other trial that you are going through. The battle is this, choosing to believe God every day. When you wake up, will you believe what God has said? Will you believe that God is good? Will you believe that when you cry, God hears us? How do we know? How do we know that God hears us when we cry? Because Jesus cried. How do we know that God is near us when our hearts are broken? Because Jesus' heart was broken. How do we know that following God will alienate us from other people? Because Jesus was betrayed by his friends. No matter what you're going through, Jesus has experienced it. Because he lived as one of us. And God will rescue you if you seek refuge in him. How do we know that God will rescue us? Because God did not rescue Jesus on the cross. The greatest moment of love in history interacted, intersected with the greatest moment of wrath in history. Because God's holy wrath was poured out, not on the world that deserved it, not on us who are sinful who choose evil. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus because Jesus, not only did he live as one of us so that he could experience all those things, but he died in our place so that we could be purchased and get that t-shirt that I told you about. The holiness of Christ redeeming us from our own evil. Everything else in this life is going to leave you hungry. Everything else in this life is going to leave you thirsty, but not Jesus. To have the longings of our soul met, because all of us have this longing. We can't even put it into words, but we know it's there. We know something's not right. We know something's missing. The longing that we're born with, to have it met, we have to seek and experience and taste and see that God is good. The Lord paints an amazing picture of this through 
a different passage of Scripture through the prophet Jeremiah. Look real quickly, Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they dug cisterns for themselves. But their cisterns are cracked, and they cannot hold water. God is saying, taste me, drink me. I'll satisfy your thirst. Jesus repeats this, come to me who are thirsty. I am the living water. Don't try to do it on your own. If you are trying to live a life that is good enough to be blessed by God, you will be crushed by the weight of that struggle because none of us are good enough. But the gospel is clear. We don't have to be good enough because Jesus was good enough. But this right here in Jeremiah is what we're tempted to do when we're overwhelmed. We're, and we, remember, we're choosing that battle each day. Are we going to believe God or not? When we're overwhelmed, when, we can't, when the thing is right here and we can't avoid seeing it, we get overwhelmed and we can fall for this lie. We're tempted to leave the only one that can satisfy our souls for the things that cannot satisfy us at all. And like David, I was saying, David is trying to tell us here, and then his son, Solomon, tells us later in Scripture. And then in, in Ecclesiastes, you see this. There is a God-shaped hole in your heart. And we try to fill this hole with so many different things. We try to fill this hole with financial success. We try to fill this hole with achievements. We try to fill this hole with physical pleasure. We try to fill this hole. God-shaped hole in our hearts with all these things. But it's all junk food. It's not nutritious. It's not satisfying. The only thing that can fill a God-sized hole is God himself. And even though, let's just be real, even though junk food tastes great, you had those donuts, it tasted great, but it's not nutritious. It cannot sustain. You get hungry faster. You lose energy more quickly. Some of y'all are sugar. You had too many samples. You're like, well, actually, no, it's because it's hot in here. Yeah, I know. Or actually, no, it's because you're boring. Yeah, sorry. The only time we can experience life at its fullest is when we are pursuing Jesus. And each week, I try. Some weeks I succeed, some weeks I fail. But I try to describe the gospel to you. I try to describe Jesus to you. But ultimately, all I'm doing is listing ingredients. You have to experience the gospel. You have to experience Jesus. A person must taste for themselves that the Lord is good. And the reason people skip church only come when it's convenient, the reason that Jesus is meaningless to them is because they have never personally experienced him. They know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And Psalm 34 is not inviting us to know about God. It's not even inviting us to or challenging us to study God's word. Other psalms do, not this one. This psalm is just inviting us to taste and see that the Lord is good, to experience him firsthand. And like I said, Jesus said the same thing. He invited people to come to him and drink. He invited people to come to him and eat because he's the living water, because his flesh is is eternal life. But think about, think about when you're outside working in the heat and you're sweating and you're getting that good sweat equity going. You've already ruined a shirt. The only thing you want to drink at that point, you don't want a Dr. Pepper. What you want is cold, refreshing water. Think about how good that water tastes. Sometimes water tastes 
But when you're hot, it tastes like it's the best thing in the world, right? It's because God made it. And God designed it to replenish what you're losing. That's the same with Jesus. That's why he says, I'm the living water. We're all in the heat because this world is broken. But Jesus is still saying, hey, come and drink. Refresh. Taste the beauty of the truth of Psalm 34, 22. Remember, it's an inclusio. He starts with how happy are people that find refuge in God, and look how he ends. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. Seek refuge in Jesus. Don't accept any substitutes, because only Jesus can satisfy. Let's pray.